the, the menu, more or less, that, uh, that we had today. And uh, we started with some uh, appetizers, if you want, which are these scalar fields, and then we went on uh, with more complicated stuff. But usually, uh, it is at the end of the meal that uh, we finally find the, the best part <laughs> in this talk. So I'm very happy that you stayed, even if I'm the last. So that was a menu of uh, extra degrees of freedom that you can add to, to Lambda City, okay? But there is this question, is it really necessary to, to do it? Is there any fundamental reason to do so, given that the, the constraint on the equation of state uh, black energy is so close to minus one? So these are just three reasons that I can think of uh, why it might be interesting to, to go beyond Lambda City. And in the end, uh, the question that we, we should answer is whether we can really detect uh, at some point uh, such a derivation, right? So this is, uh, <coughs> this is something that, uh, well, the standard law is that the way to do something like that is probably through, through perturbations, and that is what inspired, for example, uh, those people there to study in the case of a single scalar field, uh, what is the most general action that you can write uh, Insist with a single degree of freedom that, that is able to describe the perturbations in a, in a dark energy sector. And basically, what you do here is uh, to use the fact that uh, the time evolution of the background is, is breaking <coughs> time translations. Okay, so you break the diffeomorphisms in this way. Another possibility, still with a, with a single scalar field, is to try to study general theory is what uh, Emilio and Miguel have been talking about now, which is this Kolonetsky theory, which you can actually connect uh, partially to what I was writing before. And I'm not uh, writing here this uh, Lagrangian because I'm particularly interested uh, on it now, but simply because I want to point out a, a fact that has not been emphasized uh, in the previous talk, which is that the coefficient between the different operators in the the action have to be very finely tuned in order to get uh, these equations of motion with, with two derivatives that have a motivation to, to write this kind of theory, right? So the moment I, I change, for example, this one divided by six by whatever, the square root to uh, three, for example, uh, you will get something that, uh, that uh, goes against this uh, Ostrovsky theory motivation. Okay, so I want to, to explore whether this is something uh, important or to do it, maybe we should uh, take a step back and, and think about what we were doing uh, maybe 10 years ago, which was thinking, okay, let's try to, to write in a general way <coughs> whatever energy momentum tensor uh, is modified in Einstein's equations. And, and perhaps uh, what we should think is uh, this term here in a open-minded way as a, as a fluid, and, and you will understand what I, what I mean by a fluid now. Okay, so the idea for this talk is try to find the general description of, uh, of that uh, fluid and, and see what we can get from there. And the point is that uh, this, this, uh, this description already exists, and you can find it, for example, in, in that paper up there, which is actually uh, a recent construction that is based on much earlier work so that there is on these three things, which is a variational principle that comes from the late 50s. The effective field theory <coughs> for forms, which describes the way in which uh, sound propagates in a solid medium, like a table or anything, here. and the pullback formalism, which I, I will explain now what it is. Okay? And as I was saying, this has been applied uh, many fields, uh, not only in cosmology, but most recently in cosmology. But as you see, it has been used to study superfluids, uh, some way <coughs> in supersymmetric media. Uh, well, it has been used in complex mass and physics. And now we are starting to use it uh, to, to do cosmology, for example, uh, for Lorentz violating theories like uh, Diego was doing before, actually you will see what I'm going to, to describe has some, some connections to it. It has been studied for uh, to couple dark matter and dark energy, to study perturbations, to build model of inflation, and I will talk in particular about this, this work here that I, that I wrote uh, last year. Okay. 
the uh, basic astrophysics, the UC color. Yeah. Yeah, well, there was some some mention here actually. They, they used to describe a neutron star or something. Okay, so so this is uh, what is the, the basic idea that I have in mind. So the idea is <coughs> we don't we don't have a clue really what is accelerating the universe, it could be a cosmological constant or it could be anything else. The only assumption that I, the fundamental assumption that I said I want to make is that below some energy scale, whatever it is up here will behave as a, as a fluid. So that means that a low energy, this is what is going to happen, and that means that this is what you see at uh, large distances, which is what we want to modify gravity. Okay? And, and the way to, to do it is to use an effective theory. And basically, the, the power of effective theory comes from the fact that. Uh, they allow you to describe it in a very general, simple way, different models at high energies that uh, have the same uh, matter content at low energies. Okay? And you can distinguish between them from the symmetries. So this is basically the, the recipe that you need to, to build that dessert that I had in the first slide. It's basically made of uh, field content, as I said, the symmetry that you want to impose, and the energy scale that tells you where your theory is about. And I will now show you each of these things uh, step by step. So the first one is the, is the field content, which is a pullback format. Okay. And this is just the idea that if you have a fluid, a, a continuous medium, whatever it is, in, in three dimensions, in three spatial dimensions, you can describe it by assigning to each element the three labels, which represents, if you want, the, the moving coordinates of the fluid. Okay. <coughs> So basically, <coughs> by, by inverting, if you want, uh, well, by using this relationship between a system of coordinates that is external to the fluid and a system of coordinates that uh, moves together with the fluid, you can basically describe the, the trajectory. And by promoting this, uh, these coordinates to, to space-time fields, we, we are going to, to build a, a field theory. Okay. So, uh, the idea is that, uh, as I said, these, these fields are going to be the like, moving coordinates of the fluid, so that means that they have to be constant uh, along the fluid flow. And if this is uh, the velocity right, of the fluid, just by imposing that condition on the fact that we want it to be time-like in my, my convention that's the condition, then immediately we, we find that this is the, the only solution of those two equations, so we have a clear notion of what is the velocity of the fluid just from that. And <coughs> this factor that appears here is necessary to, to normalize it because of the, that condition, where this b is actually the determinant of uh, the square root of the determinant of this matrix, which is a 3 times 3 matrix, which is a 3 scale matrix. Okay? And this will appear later. So Try to remember what it is. The second ingredient was the symmetries, and I'm going to impose in particular this uh, invariance and the diffeomorphisms of these fields that preserve the volume. And I do this uh, for simplicity, not because it is necessary uh, for any profound reason, just because it's, it helps to, to constrain the number of operators that will appear in the field. But uh, you can do other things, okay? This one corresponds to half a fluid that is going to be incompressible. That's, that's, that's because of the volume is present. So, in particular, this this is quite a big symmetry actually, <coughs> and it contains inside these two things, which is uh, invariance and the rotation and translation. And uh, immediately from there, you see that uh, the theory is going to be a theory in, in the river. There is a relatively coupled theory. And uh, the point in here is that the only operator that you can build that is compatible with that symmetry up there at the lowest order in derivatives will have a single derivative acting on each field. And it's uh, the determinant of, uh, of this matrix again because of that constraint up there. So at lowest order in derivatives, the action that you write is this one. And it turns out that this describes exactly a perfect fluid where the energy density of the fluid is this function f here, which is arbitrary in principle, and the pressure is given by the first derivative of the function. So that's a <coughs> fluid. 
And then we say, okay, but uh, let's see what happens if we go on and study the theory at one order more in the derivatives. And it turns out that uh, there are many operators that you can, you can write, there are 20 something that you can think of, but uh, once you take into account uh, filter definitions, and once you take into account integrate by parts and uh, these kind of tricks, uh, you find out that there are only five of them that you can add. And you have to write them in this way here. So these are the different uh, f's that appear there, and each of them has to come uh, multiply by a function of the determinant uh, b, because this is uh, an object which is, which is of uh, order zero, if you want, in your power counting scheme. And since these are the operators of uh, higher order, they become suppressed by, uh, by scale, which is this lambda here, don't, don't think it's the cosmological constant, it's just a, a coarse grain in scale that tells you where, where your theory is, is valid, basically. And since each of these operators has two derivatives more than the, than the one that I had here, this comes out with this part. Okay. Why do you call it coarse gradient? It's more like an uh, entry part in the fluid. Mm, I call it coarse gradient because, uh, because uh, in the sense that perhaps what is uh, at higher uh, energies has nothing to do with the fluid. But if you look at the from far away, you could look like uh, that's why I put it. Also. I mean, you the course grain. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but it's, I think it's there what it means, right? Yeah, but it, I agree. It's, it's mean free path, but you can call it course grain. Also the same thing. <laughs> so, um, I have a slide missing here. How, how do you do perturbation theory in this, uh, in this framework? So what you do is uh, you use this uh, isomorphism that you can build between the two coordinate systems, the one that is mounted on the fluid and the one that is external to it. And that, uh, that I will use to, to say that at any fixed time I can fix my phi fields to be equal to the, to the coordinates of the external uh, system coordinates. And then I perturb it with this phi field this is very, very similar to what Diego was uh, showing you, for example, for the thermometric theories. The difference is that he was doing it for time while I do it for, uh, for the space uh, component. But the massive gravity. Wait. <laughs> it's not massive gravity. Uh, silly. But it's not. And uh, I'll explain you later. Uh, so, uh, I mean, there's a reason why. And so what, what you see is that uh, if you decompose this, this pi field into a longitudinal part and do transverse polarization, so there are three degrees of freedom, this is the action that you get at the uh, leading order. So just considering the first operator of, of all the leads that I wrote, the determinant of this matrix B. So the, the longitudinal mode behaves as a simple scalar field, basically. And the, the transverse ones are uh, standing weights. So basically, they, they don't have uh, gradient terms. In that sense, they don't propagate. <coughs> now, let's see what happens uh, when I put uh, the higher order corrections. Mm -hmm. uh, if you span uh, naively, what you seem to get is this uh, complicated structure with mixed derivatives, uh, second derivatives here, even coming from the different operators that I have in, in my list. But um, what you can do, since this is an effective field theory, is to use the, the equations of motion coming from the low energy theory, so that is uh, these ones here, and plug them in the, in the theory at, uh, at next to building of it. And this is not any, any funny trick or anything, it's just equivalent to your uh, field definition, so it's something you're allowed to do. And once you do that, uh, what you find is that uh, all that complicated structure ends up uh, just in uh, theory with uh, two more special derivatives. Okay. The, the transfer modes uh, still behave in the same way, and this is because of the symmetries that I have. And the, the longitudinal one, you can see that the effect of the, the new operators is simply modifying, if you want, the, the speed of propagation find the dispersion relation which gets a k square term extra. Okay, so 
basically the, the scale and the, and the relevance of, of this uh, new term is going to be controlled by the mean free path or cosine of the scale. So that's the idea. This is what happens in, in cross scale. I just show you that, that case because it's simple, but uh, once you put gravity, the story is, is basically the same. So they must be always Sorry? They must be positive. Well, uh, that depends on, uh, I mean, yeah, if you want to, to make sure that, uh, so there are two things here. So first of all, you expect that this thing is, this is going to be smaller and the uh, energy is coming from the, from the leading order the term because, uh, because of this expansion in the real order. If you wanted to push the thing to the limit to, to say that maybe it's uh, closer to the other value, then you have to, to put constraints on the sign to, to make sure that but the whole point that I'm trying to make is precisely that uh, you don't have to, to worry so much about uh, finely tuning the coefficients in this field. Precisely because it's an effective field. This is something you gain with respect to this Kordansky, uh, for example. Okay. Well, so I think that in Kordansky, that tuning is still natural. Um, if you look at good correction. That's the question I have. I don't know if it's true or not. Yeah, I, I, I think it's true. Is it? Okay. Sorry? Is it true? It is, yeah. Okay, but... Uh, I mean, you, 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 get, you get corrections, but they are suppressed. Um, that, that tuning is spoiled up to... I mean, that, as, a, as an effective theory, it's perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. Why do why people insist in uh, choosing a particular line? No, because that, that leads to the leading action. The leading action doesn't have higher derivatives. And you can show that that also implies that the corrections do not spoil the tuning. But if I started with different coefficients instead of both? If you start with different coefficients to start with, then of course you have a ghost time at, at the same scale. Of, of which but that's why I say it's a fine tuning, because I don't need to do it. No, no, I mean, it's not, it's kind of I wouldn't call it a fine tuning scale. How, how, is possible, how is possible that the treatment can be equivalent? If you start with the two coefficients, no, it's the same thing as, as, as saying that take uh, take QED, right? I mean, yeah. F3 new square. You have two terms, and they're, they're, they look like they're two, but they're not. I mean, it's just uh, because of gauge inversion. Okay, well, oh, wow. you, you don't even have to have gauge inversion, take on a billion. QCD, you have two terms, you start with two terms. There is no gauge inversion, they don't even have to be tuned uh, to start with. But you nevertheless <coughs> write down the terms because you don't want to have a ghost. We can, we can maybe see it later. Uh, I don't know what happens also if you, for example, you couple the theory into, into something else. <coughs> to me, not anyway, so, so my statement is that that tuning is, is by no means more weird than the, than the science stuff we do that in the real and the when you tune the kinetic terms. I wouldn't do the whole tuning. Okay, I'll go on for more. <laughs> then we see. So, so this is what, uh, what you get when you put gravity. Mm -hmm. You could, in principle, think of writing uh, more operators that involve the curvature, but you don't have to do that because you are working with two derivatives. Um, it turns out that even if you could write things like, for example, constraining the Ricci tensor with the derivative, so maybe the velocity of the fluid, that is already included in, in this thing here. By integrating by path, so it's actually only the rich scale you have to put once you put that. And <coughs> think of putting, for example, here an alpha, um, another function of, of B, but again, this is already, this is already here. So uh, if, if you consider only this part here, the, the leading order of term, this will be the Friedman equation, where this side, as I told you before, is basically the energy density. Once you include the, the next to leading order correction, what you get is, is this modification of the, the Friedman equation, if you want. There are different <coughs> ways of thinking of this. Uh, one could be to interpret this whole thing, if you want, as a modified uh, Planck mass, for which the, the modification is coming in terms of disorder. And they are of disorder basically because you assume that the F and the H are of the, are of the same order, which is a natural thing to assume in the, in the effective field here. And, and immediately you get that this is the order of the corrections that you get. Okay? So what this 
this tells you is that if you wanted to, to think, for example, of the, of the living other part as the matter part of your theory and then use only the next to the another one to, to have the acceleration or self acceleration, you couldn't do it <coughs> because you will have to push the, the scale of your. Uh, of your, uh, of your corrections to the, to the cutoff. So what you, what you can do is, is build a, a theory for the acceleration with a fourth theory, okay? And I can do same thing for all the different uh, perturbations that you have in the theory, so in particular for the rotational wave, what you get is a, this parameter alpha here that is actually a function, so the time, uh, that depends on two particular operators, this is the equation uh, that you get for the for the propagation of the gravitational wave. And again, the velocity deviates from the from the standard prediction by by terms of this order. And also you get a friction term like this. This is for example, this is different from what you get in Kordensky, where these two these two things are, uh, are not related in that case, but here they are because of the symmetry that I have. So then at this one point, at the background level, did you get acceleration? Did you get that? That, that depends on what uh, you choose for your f function and, and your and the coefficients that. Uh, so I mean this. So this function f is free, okay? So I can put uh, if I put uh, for example b to some power. If it is b to I don't know two thirds or something like that, you get the uh, call that. I think it's a constraint on the f prime. Yeah, so I, I saw you before actually uh, the push out like this. The, the, the energy density is F, okay? And the pressure is basically related to F, the relative of F with respect to B. So then you just choose it. And then you get it. So the prime must be negative yeah. something like that. Right? Yeah, you have to have some thermodynamics. See, if it is a fluid, it should come from thermodynamics. I mean, are there any constraints coming from thermodynamics? I don't know what you call it. With then at some point this theory, if you expect that there is a microscopic description, which is standard uh, particles moving and interacting causally uh, and all that. As I told you, I'm not, I'm not claiming this comes. No, I don't know what, where it comes from. It is a high energy. Mm -hmm. all, all they claim I have is that uh, below some energy scale, you describe it as a, as a fluid, in the sense that you can, that the field content of your theory is given by this three scale. It is true that you can define. I mean, you can you can you can push this thing analogy. Wait, wait. Okay, let me give you a, a no, wait, wait, wait. You can you can push this thing and, and go for example. You can define a term <coughs> using. I, mean. I want to say something. Else. So it's known that the first order formalism of fluids is not causal. You need if you are shear. This you need to go to the next order for uh, in the database and fix some coefficients to make this theory causal. So, no. This is a perfect Absolutely fluid. not. Yeah, this is a perfect fluid. Sorry, the first order is a perfect fluid. Okay. Second, second order, second, second order. What do you call first order? For me, it's your. No, this no, is, no, this is your first order, order thing. Different, right? uh, I think. I think that the orders are mean. In this, in this review that you, that you, if I remember properly, this review that you mentioned by this Anderson uh, comment, they, they, they explained this that they, this is not. I mean, to make a consistent theory out of this, at some point there are some problems with causality. Yeah, okay. but that's about that's about some, something. That's about this other formalism. Yeah. That's the shoots formalism. When you use, oh, sorry, this is the shoots uh, formalism. No, that's when you you know take the stress times. Uh, yes. Basically, this formula is when you take uh, conserve point, yes. the conservation equations, and yeah. then expand well, expand the stress times or the current in the theory <coughs> expansion, right? What's called the constitutive uh, relations. So. This is a different language. This is uh, there. There, and I don't think there is even uh, the, the mapping between this language and that, that language. Is um, so I, I think I think it's what you were saying is consistent. So there is no constraint from my problem. No. About the prime from anywhere. No. I mean, look, think of a quintessence thing. Okay, okay. Your chrono. Uh, is there any constraint? No, oh, but then you don't have uh, in your mind that you will build this with the uh, with materi with the materials that are uh, Lorentz invariant. For example, you tell me that your fluid is a fluid, then it comes no, from I some microscopic. I think it's clear what I said. Really fluid is something I describe with three scalar fluids, which are derivative of the full stop. If you don't like the word fluid, you can call it uh, medium or whatever. But, uh, but that's the 
has the same thing which I'm talking about. So, uh, just two slides. So, first, uh, vector modes are interesting here because what is different uh, from a single field model is that you have these two transverse uh, fields and they couple to the, to the vector degrees of freedom geometry. So, you get uh, different things like uh, more vorticity, for example, and, uh, and that, that is going to affect the, the predictions of the, of the, of the propagation of the, the vector modes. Um, and they are determined by this coefficient alpha, which is the same that we saw before, and then this, uh, this new uh, function with a gamma and psi. Uh, for scalar modes, we get uh, an isotropic stress, which is connected to the, uh, to the gravitational load. And we get also modified growth and one isotropic, so one adiabatic uh, pressure perturbation from this M and the gamma coefficient. <coughs> So this is the, the basic structure of the theory and the, the idea of this plot is that uh, if we are able to some point, uh, see different corners of the theory, uh, we can really test whether the symmetry that I was assuming is, is correct or not because uh, each different kind of observation will be affected by different factors. And if you, you could, for example, draw a very the same kind of diagram for, for nicely, but, uh, but the different uh, connections will be different between the different sectors. So, this so way you can distinguish between these two things. <coughs> Just to conclude, uh, so, so what is important here is that uh, I think this is an interesting framework to, to try to search for variations from Lana Silvia, which really goes with. Uh, single scalar field, for example. Uh, I think it's useful also because uh, you don't have to, well, we can discuss this thing of the, of the fine tuning, but I think what is good here is that uh, there's no problem with high derivatives simply because it's an effective theory. It's also powerful because it's based on symmetry principles, so that, that gives you a very clear statement of what is the, the size of your theory and what are the operators that you have to consider. It has new phenomenology, for example, this coupling of the, of the vector metric perturbations to the transverse uh, degrees of freedom. And uh, it's, it's quite peculiar in the sense that the, the breaking of the, of the background here is from the space translation of the time one, which is what people usually assume to do with 